All right, and welcome everyone. This is the Pub Crawlers. I am Bash, and joining me today is Kissipai. Hey, Kiss, how you doing? Howdy, Bash. All right, so we are going over the IRS Charity Workshop Section 7 today, which is going to be, let's take a look here, it's going to be Political Campaigns and Charities, the Ban on Political Campaign Intervention. And if we get through this quick enough, we might squeeze another one in too. So anyways, we're going to just go right into this. Welcome to political campaign. Oh shit! There's charities. no, the there's no legal eagle. This is old school. Oh no! This program is brought to you by IRS It looks like they haven't updated this one since like what 2012 or some shit. <laughs> division of the Internal Revenue Service. Listen to that audio. His mission to help taxpayers understand and comply with the tax law is presenting this podcast to help the directors, officers, and podcast. Of this is a podcast now, including churches, understand the rules on participating in a political campaign. The Man, that guy's audio that sucks. Exempt from federal yeah, income tax under Section 501c3 terrible. of the Internal Revenue Code, which includes charities and churches, may not participate or intervene in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office. For the next 15 minutes, we will explain this ban on political campaign intervention and look at how it applies to Section 501c3 organizations that conduct voter education activities advocate public policy issues, or play host to candidates. Our discussion will also highlight those areas where these organizations can participate in the electoral process. For the sake of brevity, we will use the word charity in place of Section 501c3 organization, and the word charities to refer to Even all Section 501c3 organizations. All right. Likewise, we will use like the term political campaign... Hey, but I just learned something. That weird SOS symbol means section. ...or intervening in... <laughs> <laughs> any political campaign on behalf of or in learning something new any candidate for public office finally when we say candidate for public office we are referring to any candidate in an election for a national state or local public office mm, not all okay, positions are elected some are first let's assigned. make sure we understand the basic falls rules. The, i'm sure it falls into this a charity <laughs> engages in political campaign intervention when it makes or solicits contributions to or for candidates or political organizations endorses a candidate or rates the candidates, no matter how objective such rating may be, publishes or distributes partisan campaign literature or written statements, has its representatives speak out about a candidate, or uses its resources to influence an election. All of these activities are prohibited. Charities are, however, allowed to conduct nonpartisan activities that educate the public and help them participate in the electoral process. A charity furthers a valid educational purpose when it offers instruction. Such instruction can take various forms, including voter education guides, voter registration, and get-out-the-vote drives, and candidate forums. But take heed. Mm. An educational activity can cross over into political campaign intervention, depending on the context of how it is used. So the candidate For forums, example, so we can talk about politics. Charities would violate the ban on political cool. campaign intervention right. by issuing a statement Good. in support of or we were good anyways. To no, I'm <laughs> Even a statement that does not explicitly urge its audience to vote a certain way mm. might implicitly support or oppose a candidate if the statement mentions a candidate for public office, it expresses approval or disapproval of a candidate's positions or actions, it is published during a political campaign, it mentions voting or the election, or it raises an issue on which the candidates disagree. So we then just again, need to make sure we're not making statements present, as our group, could but we can make individual statements all we want. It is part of an ongoing series of communications on the same issue that are made irrespective of the timing of any election, or it is related to an event other than the election, such as a scheduled vote on specific legislation. As you can see, hmm. the answer to the question whether a statement is in support of or in opposition to a candidate depends on the circumstances. We will examine some of those circumstances. So it seems to be much more focused on but first, like the actual candidate themselves. The websites yeah. to convey political statements. As the web becomes a pervasive and indeed predominant means of communication, it is increasingly serving as the electioneer's medium of choice. Beware. Statements posted on a website are treated no differently from statements appearing ah, in print Ah, interesting. Or okay, so we can link television. to official websites of all a candidates. A charity that posts a statement on its website that favors or presented or in educational context office, or consistent is at unbiased as much manner. Risk of political campaign Good. intervention cool. as if Just it had communicated like in print or made oral remarks. Yeah, I don't think we've ever been like that. Maybe at risk as well 
if it posts links to other websites that advocate for just being uh, conscious candidate. of what we're allowing However, on the website itself links to the official campaign yeah. websites of the candidates are acceptable if there is a link to every candidate's official website the links are presented in an educational context and are for informational purposes only and the links are presented in a consistent unbiased manner cool for That's example easy. If yeah, a charity posts an unbiased, nonpartisan voter's guide on its website, it may include a link to the official campaign website of each candidate covered in the guide accompanied by the text. For more information on gotcha. candidate X, you may consult the website's URL. Now let's look at some of the ways in which charities engage in voter education and what is and is not acceptable. One way charities engage in voter education is by helping people register to vote. A second is to help them participate in an election. A charity may conduct a voter registration or a get out the vote drive as long as it does so in an unbiased manner. To minimize the chance for bias, the charity and the people conducting the activities should avoid mentioning the candidates or political parties in written or spoken communications about the activity, okay. including publicity, posters, placards, registration materials and handouts so Any it is candidate or party good no to know more than urge people to yeah. register and vote or describe the hours and places of registration and voting and any services offered in connection with the activity voter registration forms transportation to the polling place should be offered to all regardless of their political persuasion publishing voter guides is another way that charities can engage and educate the electorate Voter guides inform the public of the attitudes or actions of their elected representatives or of the candidates for a public office. Such guides can take different forms. Some are compilations of the voting records of political incumbents, including incumbents standing for So you can inform, you can't Others pass. document the candidates' responses to questions like, uh, posed by the charity. Whatever its form, a voter guide must cover endorsement or anything like that. Yeah. And must refrain yeah, from judging the candidates or their position. Oh, this is just voting be records real are published to report the activities of a body of lawmakers, not to comment yep. on an election yeah. campaign. Charities that publish voting records often do so to lobby for a cause. But, regardless of the charity's motive, voting records can be considered political campaign intervention if they identify any incumbent as a candidate in a campaign or compare an incumbent's positions with those of other candidates or the charity. This is especially so if the voting records are published simultaneously with a political campaign or aimed at areas where campaigns are occurring. For instance, a charity that publishes an annual compilation of the voting records of members of Congress on major legislative issues that cover a wide range of subjects is not engaged in political campaign intervention if the publication contains no editorial opinion and its content. This is interesting because last night, for instance, I was looking at um, a couple bots that automate um, posting to like Twitter and other things, like whenever uh, Congress, any Congress member makes a trade or some shit like that, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And so it's interesting because I feel like that would actually fall under some of this stuff. Like if we link to it, we'd have to be really careful on that shit as long as it makes sure it like contains everybody, you know? Yeah, yeah. Not saying that we would, but just can be a good tool for seeing the direct link now candidates and the issues and disseminating the information to the public but it can also be a means to intervene in a political campaign to avert the charge of political campaign intervention a charity should take care in how it phrases the questions so as not to suggest a preferred answer <laughs> or just like it not fuck around with this at all <laughs> to all candidates for a particular like if you're going to do campaign shit man that CPAC or SPAC or like PAC editing, and avoid comparing those responses to its own positions yeah. as we have seen a charity Hardly, may not advocate for around. or against like citizens united literally office. gave people a way to do hand, unlimited donation should for or against campaigns issue as long as that advocacy oh, yeah. further but like mission. they're still super charities strict on what charities do and i like that i like that a lot that's a like that campaign. makes me happy but honestly not use advocacy as an excuse for or to double as political campaign intervention a charity risks intervening in a political campaign when its message invites the recipient to compare a candidate's position on an issue with the organization's own views. Oh, interesting. The message need not expressly urge a vote for or against a candidate, nor need it even mention a candidate by name. Candidates can be conjured up by substituting party labels or code words for names, conservative, liberal, pro-life, pro-choice, or when the message concerns an issue that well that's not true no because pro-life and pro-choice are legislation things that are uh like specific Imagine, to for instance 
two candidates like running for the state the topic Senate and, and they're not district. specific to the party so that was that was a weird extrapolation that they made that correlation project. that's like saying all it. i'm going to pause this for a second that's like saying all republicans are pro choice and all democrats are pro life like like that that was that was wrong that was wrong charity dedicated to community development and an advocate for mass transit would be engaging in political campaign yeah, intervention if is. its director were it to a give a public address shortly before right. the election. Still, though, <laughs> still, that was, that, that was like, For those mm, of you who care about quality of life in our district and its growing traffic congestion, there is a very important choice coming up next month. We need new mass transit. You have the power to relieve the congestion and improve your quality of life. Use that power when you go to the polls and cast your vote for state senator. Yeah, I see what she, what they're saying, though. I do, but during an election, but it Wait, was that a good example? Or yeah, that one. Or that one was a better example. Not identify whether candidates agree with its position. It's basically it's saying, you know, like you, you're not supposed to compare people and their uh, this is another helpful thing. positions on things to the group itself to and like the group's position on things. Election. But if with oh, the structure okay. of our group. We now literally don't have a position on things. That's like the say, essence of our group. Often attend or are to speak yeah, like, like everyone has fun. their own individual. In we don't as a group, no. Or in some other role, as subject matter expert, public figure, or celebrity, for example. When a candidate appears in a role other than that of candidate... I'm actually going to take a picture of this one, too, just election, just in case, because one of the things that I would love to have is people show up to the meetups. A non you know? At the event. It's nice to have, like, people, None like, you know, the involved and the interact. Candidacy, and no I'm being super cheap with these notes, though. During the candidate's appearance. I'm just taking pictures and <laughs> pasting Furthermore, <laughs> any announcement yeah. concerning the I mean, one was done with this one, anyway. ...such as an invitation should clearly indicate the capacity in which the candidate is to appear. And avoid mention of his or her candidacy. Okay. The host charity should I mean, inform the employees that the events are not campaign events and obtain their commitment to appear in their non candidate It's really not. It's really straightforward. And, not the election and it's not the sitting there campaign. chatting forever. A charity that invites one candidate to speak in the role of right. candidate is engaging in political you campaign intervention in unless it gives all kind of miss qualified him. candidates I do an equal miss opportunity to speak. And where's Bobby if and the charity invites and one candidate to speak at this popular annual banquet, Where's that creepy old guy that's trying to do everything to like scandalous? Attended general meeting, <laughs> it has not given the candidates an equal opportunity. The only Speaking invitations and events must be substantially audio. similar. Mm. <laughs> Plus, the charity must make it clear that it Crispy. neither supports nor opposes the invitee's candidacy. Needless to say, no political fundraising should be allowed at the event. One solution is to have all the candidates appear together on the same stage and answer questions posed by a moderator or by members of the audience. A candidate forum gives its audience a unique opportunity to evaluate and compare the candidates. But the host charity must see to it that the candidates are treated fairly and impartially. A candidate forum is more likely to be fair and impartial if all qualified candidates for a given office are invited to the forum. Mm, the questions are prepared and presented by an independent, nonpartisan panel. The discussion covers a broad range of issues of interest to the public. Each candidate is given an equal opportunity to speak, and the moderator and the forum sponsors refrain from commenting on the questions, the answers, or the candidates. <laughs> no making while faces while they're talking. While to participate <laughs> in the political campaign, Directors, officers, or other laughing. charity officials are not under the same restriction as long as they act in a private, not an official capacity. That'd be something you'd have to watch out so for as to leave no yeah. doubt, officials should make it clear that they are acting or speaking for themselves alone and not for the charity. Additionally, officials may not use the charity's financial resources, facilities, or personnel yeah, this is all like to support <laughs> or oppose a candidate. Yeah, Officials of acting in a private capacity <laughs> may mention their association or position with the charity for the purpose of identifying themselves, but they should disclaim any endorsement of their actions by the charity. On printed matter, the following language would serve as a sufficient disclaimer. So I think it's going to be really important to have a couple uh, very detailed lines no in the Articles of Association for any officers in contrast, or officials. Officials are not know. acting in a private capacity when they endorse a candidate at charity functions or through the charity's official endorsing publication. candidates and all that then just to make sure that they the like actions of the, the, the basics of these the these rules are put to together where they like campaign intervention can be held to that because mm -hmm. if we don't put something in there i don't i don't want it to ever be questioned prohibited campaign activity oh, yeah. the charity could lose its tax exempt status 
and it could be subject to an excise tax mm. on the amount of money spent on that activity. Since 2004, the IRS has conducted limited scope examinations of allegations of political campaign activity by Section 501c3 organizations. While less than half of the allegations received resulted in an examination, the IRS found political campaign intervention in over two-thirds of the organizations that were selected for what examination. Are these guys wow. Doing? As we are wow. interested in educating organizations and That's like clients, in most of these damn near sixty-seven percent of the all the ones that they checked. Not to repeat the <laughs> Jeez. Since the tax law but the crazy thing is, they only checked half of the ones reported. What the fuck? Political campaign for or against? <laughs> they just kind of glossed over that rate. stat a little bit. <laughs> the could the exam status of a charity that engages yeah. in political campaign intervention. We have proposed revocation in a few egregious cases. So technically, I guess it might only be 30% or 33% of all the ones that they checked, since they might have only checked the ones that they knew probably were doing something wrong. Ah, I see they're trying to fuck those statistics a little bit. At irs.gov slash EO, you will find IRS Revenue Ruling 2007-41, job lines and number of scenarios to help charities and churches understand the ban on political campaign activity. Nah, they don't have the funds for that. And... Publication 1828. They really know. Tax Guide for Churches and Religious Organizations, which discusses the political campaign prohibition the as it applies to churches. for churches and religious to organizations stay informed of is new just information like available from the IRS. Three-page magazine. Sign up for the <laughs> it's just like a picture a of a person like <laughs> being excited, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. You're welcome for taking that mini course. You are very welcome. And um, where where is my where is where's my certificate of completion? <clears throat> yeah, really. Excuse me. Um yeah. What the frick? All right, so we're actually going to do this real fast and just move on to section 8 real quick like Is it going to be crispy audio like this? I think it might be newer. Let's double check. I hope so, fingers crossed. Mm. Please. Yes. Okay. Yes, it looks like it's you slightly updated. Yeah. Hmm. Just gonna update Maybe. some things. Hold on. Charity gaming. Oh, here we go. All right, hold on. Just switching this over on uh, Zencaster as well. Oh yeah. As soon as we get you over, you might have to click on something like uh, approval or something. Yeah, I pretty much have to re rejoin. Ah, gotcha. Go. Yeah. All right, I'm just going to start this one up. Boom. That's ready to go. Charitable ready to go. You ready to start this? Oh, I'm ready. All right. Welcome to the Charitable Gaming for Exempt Thank Organizations you. course. This course is presented by the Exempt Organizations right. Office of the IRS. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Legal, the Stay Exempt hey. Eagle. Hello, Lego. This is here at Stay Exempt. This course includes questions and activities that test your knowledge. Oh. You'll be instructed to click on the, the other screen one to participate faster. in the activities. <laughs> when you're ready to learn yeah. about charitable gaming for exempt Continue. In this course, we'll talk <laughs> about the rules for We're going quick today. We're going quick. That conduct gaming activities. We'll also discuss how to Which determine great, withholding amounts and start. how and when to report those gaming taxes appropriately. What was that? When I you're ready to learn about like charitable starting. gaming for exempt organizations, oh, shit. select the charitable you need, gaming Like, Go button. grab some food real quick, bro. No, it's not that bad. Oh, okay, okay. If it was that bad, I would have told you, like, yo, right. give me a half hour. I gotta go eat. <laughs> I mean, like, you can eat while you do this. No one, no one will know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, objective. Review rules for tax exempt organizations that conduct gaming activities, determine withholding amounts, and report gaming taxes appropriately. Hi, um, I'm Richard. I'm on the board of a Section 501c3 organization Richard's called Cute and Curly Cute. Animal Rescue. Curly. And I've heard What's that wrong with straight hair animals? can be a good way to fundraise. Can you help <clears> me? I sure can, Richard. From the Saturday night bingo in the church hall to okay, the bingo is very specific. The Veterans Club <laughs> and the poker tournament at the Fraternal Lodge. All are examples of gaming or gambling for organizations exempt from federal income tax. 
Wow, that's a lot of different games. Charitable gaming is one of the most common and successful methods of producing income for many tax-exempt organizations. But remember that for almost all tax-exempt organizations, including 501c3s, gaming activities don't, by themselves, further an exempt purpose. So you have to be careful about how much gaming you do and pay attention to the additional tax and reporting requirements your gaming activities may produce. Let's talk about how your organization can comply with IRS rules while conducting gaming activities. Select the Lawful Gaming Practices button. Can you explain the rules for conducting charitable gaming? No problem. If I'm going too quick at all at any point, just let me know, by the way. requires a gaming license from the state where your organization conducts the games. And to prevent gaming activities from jeopardizing your organization's federal tax exemption, you need to make sure the gaming doesn't become a substantial part of your organization's activities. For certain games, some specific excise taxes and filing requirements may apply. And unless your game meets one of the exceptions to being treated as an unrelated business activity, the income may be Unrelated Business Income, or UBI for short, which is taxable to your organization just like regular income. What kinds of games or gambling fall under these rules? There are many games that may be exempt from UBI. I'm just oh, going to take a picture of that. Yep, that's list, a that's, the UBI that's, test that's a What's picture. What's a button to learn more? Um, I think that's... I think it's kind of like bingo. Oh. But with beans? No, I'm just kidding. I have no idea. I have no idea at all what it is. Watch that be it, actually. <laughs> Calcutta wagering. Pickle jar. Wait, what? Pick- Pickle jars? Mick- That's got to be a name. Tip jars. Punch boards. Tip board. What's a tip board? Certain oh. video games? NFT games. <laughs> they don't eat. Bro, the. It's going to be like five, ten years before the IRS understand anything about like I've taken anything your state like exempt course. <laughs> They're not even through understanding income. crypto and yet, man. Three-part test for unrelated yeah. business income. That's does the three-part <laughs> test apply to gaming activities too? Yes, it does, Richard. Generally, your gaming activity will be considered a trade or business, which is part one of the test. And as I said earlier, it's not related to furthering your organization's exempt purpose, which is part three of the test. So, if your organization regularly conducts gaming activity, part two oh, of the test, you know what the Bito gaming is? income will be considered unrelated business income it's unless an keto. exception applies. Oh. Select the exceptions button to oh, learn okay. more. This is actually a nice little picture. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting lazy. I'm getting lazy with my note taking. Or I'm getting faster. Yeah more efficient there we go yes i'm improving my note taking that's what it is <laughs> oh that was a terrible picture ubi exemptions so consider this many states or expectations as a oh god issuing a charitable gaming license require games to be conducted by volunteers how do you okay. think that requirement will affect the tax treatment of your gaming income well i've already heard of the volunteer labor exception to ubi so i assume that conducting an activity using a team of volunteers shouldn't generate any UBI. That's right. Gaming activities that are run using volunteer labor won't be treated as a source of UBI. So, do you remember the gaming-specific UBI exception from the UBI course? Let's see. Oh, how about the bingo exception? That's it. This exception applies to any what? game that's the traditional yep. type of bingo. You remember that? Where all wagers are placed. Oh, you might not have been here. Yeah, bingo's weird, dude. They got weird rules for bingo. Like, specifically like bingo. Playing in that how, that's how the game also has to be legal under state around. and local law. Yep. And Certain has to be played laws. in a jurisdiction where like bingo games are bingo. not regularly conducted by for-profit organizations. Select more exceptions to move ahead. Are you good on this one? Yep. There There are a couple other gaming-related exceptions to UBI. The first, income from qualified public entertainment activities, will meet the exception if it's conducted by a qualifying organization and is the type of activity traditionally conducted at a fair or exposition promoting agriculture and education. 
A qualifying organization is an organization exempt under Section 501c3, Section 501c4, or Section 501c5 that regularly conducts an agricultural or educational fair or exposition as one of its substantial exempt purposes. Here's an example. Organization X, a 501c5 agriculture organization, conducts harness racing at an agricultural fair in State L, pursuant to a state law that permits the organization to conduct paramutual betting in connection with the races. Income from wagers placed is excluded from the tax on unrelated business income. The last UBI exception I'll mention includes most games of chance conducted by exempt organizations in North Dakota, as long as the conduct of the games doesn't violate a state or local law. More details on these exceptions can be found in the Public Entertainment Activity and Gambling Activities Other Than Bingo paragraphs of Publication 598. Okay, so you want to know something really interesting? I've actually, uh, like, this little bit where it says uh, regularly conducts expo or educational fair exposition of its uh, substantially exempt purpose, that's why one of the things for our thing is the e-waste thing because uh oh. using like not for this specifically but what it does is by using our funds in a substantial position for like education and trying to reach back out to the public um in more ways than one that makes the irs look at us as much more of a like automatically this is a worthwhile charity oh, than I see. one that just uses its funds internally so they, they really specifically look for places where they're either being education-wise or outreach-wise um, to other charities or to other, like, needed public services. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, that actually is really, really important. And that's, yeah, that's the whole e-waste oh, thing for ours. Perfect. Yeah. All right, going to go on so to I the next it. one. My organization's charitable gaming might be taxable if it doesn't meet one of these exceptions. You catch on fast, Richard. Remember that your taxable income involves two wagering excise taxes you need to know about. One applies to the amount wagered, the other applies to the people accepting the wagers. But neither applies to traditional legal bingo. These excise taxes also don't apply to charitable gaming as long as none mm. of the proceeds benefit private individuals mm -hmm. or insiders. This is good news ah, for yeah. organizations exempt under Section 501c3 because their income must not benefit private individuals or insiders. So yeah, a properly operating 501c3 mm -hmm. wouldn't be subject to the federal wagering excise taxes for any legal gaming activities it conducts. But for the benefit of any non-c3 organizations that might be looking in, we'll go ahead and touch on these two excise taxes. The first is a tax based on the gross amount of wagers received, which is reported and paid on Form 730 every month. The second wagering excise tax is an annual occupational tax imposed on each person liable for the tax on wagers or upon any person engaged in receiving wagers. An organization would be liable for these taxes even if it doesn't conduct charitable gaming activities very often, just an annual raffle for example. An organization also might be liable for these excise taxes even if its charitable gaming activity meets one of the UBI income tax exemptions. Next, let's talk about God, that's gross. for reporting winnings and withholding tax when conducting charitable gaming. Yeah. Fair enough. Man, that's why so many... Uh... Casinos are so not Richard. On it's Saturday night, land. and your organization is hosting a bingo game meeting the statutory bingo Makes exclusion. Mm -hmm. Vernon pays five dollars for a bingo card and sits down to play. Bingo! It's Vernon's lucky night. He wins the game and the jackpot of twelve hundred dollars. In nice, tax terminology, Vernon. the wager right is five dollars and the winnings are twelve hundred dollars. Did you know that your organization must report Vernon's winnings to the IRS? Wow. Yes, Any? via form W2G, which is their what gambling form. form. We we'll go through all that now, and I'll point you to some resources you can use later. To start, unless the winnings are from bingo, slot machines, keno, or poker tournaments, you must report winnings, including raffle prizes, when the amount paid is $600 or more, and at least 300 times the amount of the wager. 
In determining whether the $600 threshold is met, you have to subtract the wager from the winnings, depending on the type of gaming. See publication 3079 for details. You'll report to both the IRS and the winner on Form W-2G certain gambling winnings. The winner should provide you with proper identification, including his or her social security number, so you oh, this is really important to know for things when we do like uh, uh, of copy if we do like of uh, pools G for uh, using like sports betting or if we do um, uh, like so Final Fantasy betting forward. kind of thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. So we'll just have to make sure the amounts stay under that, which they are. They have been. Yeah. Like, it's been like 50 bucks, I think, is the most. Yeah, it's been pretty reasonable. But... You never know. We might grow bigger in the future where we won't have to worry about it. Right. Your Good to know. If your organization conducts bingo, keno, operates slot machines, or runs a poker tournament, the reporting rules differ slightly from those just described. How so? For bingo and slot machines, you must report if gross winnings before deducting the wager equal $1,200 or more. With keno, if winnings after deducting the wager are $1,500 or more, you'll report them. For poker tournaments, the reporting threshold is higher. The winnings need to be more than 5000 after deducting Perfect. the wager. In poker tournaments, the wager is usually called the entry or buy-in fee. When do you file the W-2G? You complete and give copies B and cool, C. Cool, so we can actually have like legit W2G poker night. To the winner oh, fuck the you, same nostril. Time you pay the winnings. Or oh, no I hate later that. than by January 31st of the year after the year in which you paid the winnings. Send copy A to the IRS by February 28 or 29 of the year after the year in which you paid the gaming winnings. Note that there are special reporting rules that apply to foreign winners, Form 1042-S, and when the person receiving the winnings is not the actual winner or is a member of a group of winners, Form 5754. Hmm. However, these topics are beyond the scope of this course. Understood. Now it's time. So to don't let any of our foreign folks win. Got it. Tax on <laughs> we'll managers. put that in the rules. <laughs> Intro to withholding. What is withholding? Regular withholding is the collection and depositing of federal income tax from the amount won. In some cases, when paying and reporting gambling winnings to prize winners. Tax-exempt organizations are required to withhold income tax from those winnings. There's also backup withholding, which we'll cover in a minute. The general rule for regular withholding is that you must withhold income tax from a payment of winnings when the proceeds from the wager are more than $5,000 and the wager was placed in a sweepstakes, wagering pool, lottery, raffle, or poker tournament, or any other wagering transaction, if such proceeds are at least 300 times the amount wagered. The proceeds from a wager are the difference between the amount of the winnings and the amount of the wager. Click continue to move on. Got it. Sniff that real quick. Alrighty. There we go, good to go. Remember that you don't need to withhold from traditional bingo, keno, or slot machine winnings no matter what the amount won. You don't need to withhold on winnings from a poker tournament either as long as you report the winnings on Form W-2G. Okay, so I know when and when not to withhold. But how much does my organization withhold? And what does it do with the withheld amounts? The regular withholding rate is 25%. But check the instructions Damn. for Form W-2G to verify the rate for the year when you're paying a prize. The amount subject to withholding is the difference between the amount of the winnings and the amount of the wager. Withhold on the entire amount, not just on the portion greater than $5,000. Ah. Your organization will show the amount withheld in Box 4 of the Form W-2G that it will give to the winner and will send to the IRS. Yep. In addition, your organization will report annually the total amount of federal income tax it withheld during the year on Form 945, Annual Report of Withheld Federal Income Tax, by January 31st following the close of the reporting year. Okay. You also ask about what your organization should do with the withheld amount. Hang on to that question. We'll get back to it in a minute when we discuss Form 945 in more detail. 
All right. Good to go? Yep. You mentioned another type of withholding a minute ago, backup withholding. What is that, and how is it different? The backup withholding rate is higher, and under certain circumstances, you'll have to use it. So, when the winner of reportable winnings doesn't furnish a correct taxpayer identification number or a uh-huh, for that short, fucking wonderful 28% again. Not been withheld, yeah. and winnings are at least $600 and at least 300 times the wager, or the winnings are at least $1,200 from bingo or slot machines, or $1,500 from Kino, or more than $5,000 from a poker tournament, then your organization will withhold and remit 28% of the winnings. If it chooses, your organization can reduce the amount of the winnings by the amount of the wager before figuring the withholding amount. Remember that I said regular withholding doesn't apply to bingo, slot machines, or Kino. If a winner of one of these types of games doesn't provide you with his or her TIN, then the winnings will be subject to backup withholding if they are above the limits I just mentioned. If your organization mistakenly pays a winner the entire prize when the winner hasn't provided his or her TIN, then your organization will be responsible for paying the backup withholding (laughs) amount. Like regular withholding, your organization must report backup withholding using Form W2G, and Form 945. Next, let's talk about withholding when the prize is something other than cash. Select the withholding button to continue. Mm. What if we conduct Ooh, a fundraising oh, raffle or other game where the Fucking prize is shit. a car or a big screen <laughs> TV or some other non-cash item? Does the organization still have to withhold taxes? Yes, the same withholding rules and reporting rules for that matter apply whether the prize is cash or non-cash. So, if your organization is giving away prizes like a vacation or a big screen TV, the fair market value of the item won is the amount of the winnings. Regular or backup withholding rates will apply to these prizes just like they do for the cash prizes we've already discussed. In the case of a non-cash prize that's large enough to require withholding, the winner may pay the 25% regular withholding amount to the organization. The organization yep, will collect that's usually it when the what prize you see. is awarded. The organization may opt to pay the regular withholding on behalf of the prize winner. However, if it does, the withholding rate is 33.33%. What? Of the Where the fuck does that 5.5% come from? And if the winner doesn't provide his or her... <laughs> Technically 7.5. Your organization would back up withhold, just like it would for a cash prize. Yeah, that's so let fucked. me see if I've got it. Let's say... My organization sells raffle tickets for $2 for a grand prize of a flat screen TV with a fair market value of $2,000. We'll give the winner a form W2G because the fair market value of the TV minus the wager, one ticket, is more Mm. than $600 and and more more than 300 300 times the amount of the wager. We Mm. won't withhold though because the total price value is less than $5,000, right? Yes, as long as he or she gave your organization his or her correct TIN. Now we've talked a little about reporting using Form 945, but there's more you should know about the form. Select the Form 945 button. To- Yay. First of all, you cool going on my bad. I didn't ask. For any yep. taxes withheld from gaming winnings is non-payroll withheld taxes. You report these withheld taxes on Form 945, annual return of withheld federal income tax separately from any taxes you might have withheld from your organization's employees. You'll report all non-payroll withheld taxes in one Form 945 filing, which is due no later than January 31st of the year after the year in which the taxes were withheld. Oh, that's so weird. It's like, that's how they all work. your game's winners is less yeah. than $2,500 for the entire year, your organization can pay it in full when it files the Form 945. Use the payment voucher Form 945-V to do this. If the total withheld taxes will be $2,500 or more for the year, your organization will need to deposit them by electronic funds transfer either monthly or semi-weekly. See Section 11 of Publication 15, Circular E, Employer's Tax Guide for deposit instructions. And for non-cash prizes, remember to collect any required withholdings from the winners before your organization gives them their prize. If it doesn't, your organization will have to pay the taxes. Select the Knowledge Check button to continue.
So why not just deduct it from the fucking... Oh, for the non-cash. I see what they're saying. So yeah. you have to collect it for the IRS. Why would you have... Like, that... It almost makes more sense. Oh, I see what it is. It's in case that person... Does. Ah, I get it now. Okay. Yeah. Now I see why they do it. Ready to move on? Oh, I'm ready. Is there Go. Our next button? Go. Oh. 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 <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, all right. Sure. Let's see knowledge what you check. With this series of knowledge Which check of the questions. following statements is Select true of the form W two G statement for recipi- recipients of certain gambling winnings? You only need to file a form W two G when submitting form nine nine. No, that's not. What the fuck? Are you kidding me? Um, do you even know what Form 990 is? Like, seriously? Like, really? That's the annual return for our entire organization. Anyways. Uh, churches are not required to form. I mean, that is true. Uh, I was going to say, that's probably true. You must. No, no, it actually did bring up churches earlier. It did say that they have to, um, as long as they're uh, uh, 501c3s. Ah. Uh. Um. Um, you must file form W two G with the IRS by February twenty eighth, following the calendar year in which you paid the. That is true. Yeah. Form W two G can also be used to claim that bingo tables were. <laughs> okay, let's see. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Moving on. So now let's check number two. Four situations where non cash prize requires tax to be withheld. The organization should always collect the withholding from the winner before delivering the prize. Yes. Always collect the withholding from the winner the day after reward. No. Make sure the winning promises to pay. No. Mark it on your calendars. Oh my God! It's a. Yeah, that was pretty obvious. Knowledge check done. So, what kind of filing errors can my organization, or I, be penalized for? If your organization fails to file correct or complete information returns by the due date, or fails to file correct or complete payee statements without reasonable cause, it can incur penalties. In addition, if your organization doesn't withhold and deposit taxes as required, a trust fund so I want to like take this page right here penalty, and write the all of these things into our article of association. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you must, oh, yeah. you must do this by this. You must do this by this. We're not going to do any of those things, but just in case you do. <laughs> like withholding taxes in an amount equal to the You'll know what to taxes. expect at least. All right. Next, let's review what we've discussed. Select the recap button to continue. Hold on, I'm taking a picture of your stuff. Nice and tight picture. Yeah. Yeah. Bam. Recap. Here's what we've covered so far. First, we learned some basics about charitable gaming, and I explained that it's a common and successful method for producing income for tax-exempt organizations. I like the poker idea. Gaming doesn't further the exempt purpose of an organization. Can we somehow probably rig a poker AI. game? There are to exceptions, be bingo? exclusions, and deductions that can apply. God. It seems there are like bingo also modifications is just... To the UBI no, poker's better. To no, poker's better. B- poker has a limit of winning. You don't report it unless it's over 5,000. Bingo, it's 1,200. Yeah, that's the good part about poker. Back to the graphic like, help. honestly, then the best thing to do is just make a charity in North Dakota if you're going to do any gambling. <laughs> bingo, and slot machines. UBI graphic? requirements for regular withholding. Link is active at end of slide. Oh my god, they even put a fucking little note on there because people are probably like, ah, it's not working. Finally, we covered penalties. Sorry that you Select can hear that the clicking. Check button to continue. Thanks for giving us a recap um, that you should have definitely showed us this at the beginning. I'm just saying, like, this is what we're going to talk about specifically. <laughs> yeah. Know. Select the correct answer, then click the submit button to check. When the winner account. fails to provide his or her tax ident or taxpayer identification number, the game operator must ask the winner to pay the correct tax when fi- withhold from the prize. Yep, okay, it's that one. Yeah. And I'll read it all the way out. Like see, though. Ask the winner to ask keep the winner it. To keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking funny. Progress Great check. Great job. You've completed the charitable gaming course. Remember that all these Yay! topics and more are covered in detail in IRS Publication 3079, Tax Exempt Organizations and 3079. Gaming. I haven't read Thanks that one for yet. Taking our course and watch for more updated courses here at Stay Exempt. If you don't give me my fucking, um, I did a thing, thing, I'm gonna be so mad. I know I've shared a lot of exempt organizations Ooh. resources with you. 
I've put them together Here's here, more. so feel free to review them. Yeah, these are all really important. What's Form 9? Eh. Oh. Oh, God. Annual That's summary of transmittal of U.S. information serious. returns. Mm. Why is it in, like, eye bleeding red? Because I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Annual summary of trans... Nagra, what's this? Yeah, what's Nagra? It's not even a link! <laughs> There's... <gasps> Damn it, IRS! It's non-clickable. We're complaining. Yeah, none of it. It's it's not you can't highlight it, you can't nothing. Create QR yeah, code for this page? Thing. Yeah, let's create a fucking QR code for this page. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, cool. So On conclusion. Hey, everyone we in the IRS Section eight, Organizations gone. Division. Thank you for taking this course. You're welcome. Before you leave, please take a minute to send us your feedback. The information you provide will ensure that this and other courses at Stay yeah, Exempt provide a valuable learning experience for future participants. I still have a whole bunch of feedback written on my email. whiteboard over here. After you've sent your feedback, you can print out Hell a certificate yeah. of completion as recognition for attending this course. The whole two cents. But yeah, I mean, they have some fucked up shit. They really do. Hey, this one works. What's the date today? 19... All right, with changes. Boom, banged out two of them. So, real quick, I'm just gonna cut a bit, stick around for a second, um, but thank you everyone for joining us. That was section seven and eight, and uh, we will get the last two finished off here very soon. So, cheers, see you soon.